seated. So this Advent season, we're looking in detail at Mary's Magnificat, the exclamation of praise that spills from her lips as she sees her cousin Elizabeth, and Elizabeth confirms the, the, the joyous miracle that Mary is experiencing within her womb. And as we looked the first week at the first part of this prayer, we talked about what it meant to be favored by God, and that being favored by God did not mean necessarily that we're going to escape any pain and suffering in the world. Quite the contrary, Mary's life became quite complicated and difficult, thanks to being favored by God. But nevertheless, it is by being favored by God that God uses us, chooses us, works through us to accomplish God's will on earth as in heaven. Last week we looked at goodness and mercy, at the mighty acts of God and at God's mercy spilled out for generations. And we reflected on how humility and the things that humble us often are the things that open us to be able to see the amazing power of God at work in our lives, despite our failures and our mistakes. And that it is often when we are humbled that we begin to crack open our hearts just a little more to the presence and power of God available to us here and now. And we looked at how Mary's experience of being humbled before God enabled her to see the mighty acts of God at work even in her. And she was able to anticipate God's mercy extending for generation upon generation. Today, I want to talk about a theological affirmation that was articulated much later as God's preferential option for the poor. It was an articulation of a sense of how God works, who God chooses, why God seems to have a particular and peculiar need and desire to work with and among those who find themselves on the margins and not at the center of things. Now, <clears throat> every society, no matter how they are constructed, how their economy is organized, how their politics are shaped, Every society has some people who, who sit at the center and who reap the benefits of that particular social uh, organization. Some people just manage to reap more of the goodies than a, a number of other people do. The structure is set up in such a way that they are significantly more benefited by that social structure. And every society, no matter which society it is, has people who find themselves disconnected from that wealth and from that, that well-being that some others enjoy. And so, no matter where we go, communist, capitalist, the democratic, or, uh, or um, socialist, or, or whatever the, the, the framework is that a particular nation chooses to organize itself politically and economically, there are always going to be some who really benefit and some who don't. So as we look at that reality in San Antonio, our own community, in the last couple of years, our city council has been working very hard to understand why is it that there are certain parts of our community that just continuous, continuously experience poverty and the inability for, for the community itself to be able to rise up and benefit from the general prosperity that San Antonio is enjoying right now. My friend and colleague, uh, well, she's not a uh, pastoral colleague, but Christine Drennan, professor at Trinity University, has been singularly responsible for helping educate our city council in this dynamic. For many, many, many years, the city budget 
was divided in a way that gave equal parts of discretionary spending to all of the 10 different districts. So you had this much money available to share, and they just said, we'll give the same amount to all 10. That's equal, right? That's fair to give everybody the same amount, isn't it? And she was able to say, there is a difference between equality and equity. There's a great little graphic, you could hit that for me. So equality is on the left here, right? Everybody gets one box, which is great if everybody is the same height, right? If everybody can see over the fence with that one box, then everybody gets to enjoy the baseball game. But equity means to take the available resources and distribute them in a way that enables everyone to be able to have access to the game. Does that make sense? Do you see the difference between those? And so part of what has happened in our city council is that they are beginning to redistribute some of what that, sh that even share would have gone to some of the areas of our city that are much better off and are trying to reinvest that in some of the areas of our city that have historically been neglected. Neglected. Now, that sharing in order to create equity is something that we find God doing all the time in Scripture. God seems always to be wanting to pay attention to the ones who are outside the system in some way. And I think the reason for that is that if, if you just think about it, in any given system, in any given society, who are the people that are gonna know that things are broken? The ones who aren't benefiting. They're the ones who are gonna experience that things aren't working right. Things aren't working in the way that they ought to work because clearly this entire group of people is not benefiting from the way it's organized right now. So we need to find a way to bring them in. As we look at scripture, we discover that God is constantly placing God's presence and God's self among the ones who are on the outside. Women who have no children like Elizabeth. Widows and orphans who are regularly identified as those who deserve particular attention from those who govern. Immigrants and foreigners who don't often share the same rights as citizens. Slaves and oppressed workers like the Israelites in Egypt whom God came to be with and accompany through Moses so that they would experience freedom instead of slavery. The infirm and the imprisoned, the lame, the deaf, whom Jesus reached out to time and time again to restore to health so that they could partake more fully. And the hungry and the poor. All of these marginal groups, all of these people who don't find the way things are organized to be in their benefit are the people to whom God goes, are the people with whom God chooses to walk preferentially. Because if change is going to happen, it's going to have to happen from that perspective because that's the perspective that demonstrates where the problems are. Mary understands this. Mary gets it. And as she exclaims in praise in the song that we have before us today, she exclaims her affirmation of God's preferential choice to work among those who do not have rather than those who do. Because only then will everyone be able to get what they need. She says, God has acted powerfully to scatter those who are proud in the imagination of their hearts, to bring down the powerful from their thrones and to lift up the lowly. 
God has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. This affirmation in the 1970s was something that Latin American theologians <coughs> laid hold of and named God's preferential option for the poor. Well, there were a lot of people who didn't like that phrase, especially people here. <laughs> we didn't like all the theologians who were from Europe and North America didn't like the idea that God would prefer a group other than ourselves. So often when we define God's chosen people, we're always the ones who are in the circle. And, and, and in this articulation, we were somehow outside that circle. Not really because God doesn't not love us, but the wealthier nations were feeling that sense of, wait a minute, how doesn't God love us too? And they would argue against it. But I don't believe this articulation from the, the folks in Latin America was to try and exclude others. But it was to try to say, no, God wants to include all of us. But God's got to start at the bottom in order to do that. My friend Jose Marines used to tell the story of Jesus coming and, and, and taking what he called the last position in the line of humanity. He said, it's like Jesus came to earth and he was like, where's the line? Okay, okay. Are you the last one? In line? Oh, no. Are you the last one in line? Okay, I'm going to be the very last one in line. Because only from here can I embrace everybody. Because that's God's heart. God's heart is to embrace everybody, to give everybody a chance to play in the game of God's cosmic work to make things new. Last week we sang the hymn, The World is About to Turn, which is an articulation in hymnody of this same song of Mary that, that reminds us with every chorus, with every, the refrain at the end of verse, that God is engaging in this cosmic somersault to take the world as it is and to flip it so that those who are on the bottom can experience the gift of having enough. But that kind of change, that kind of flipping, is only possible if we can see the problem. If we see those who are outside. When I first started leading mission trips together with Rosemary Engstrom from First Presbyterian Church, we would uh, do a couple of days or nights of orientation for the group so they could get to know each other and, and, and um, build some relationships before we took off. But one of the things that I would do is I would map a route of San Antonio and ask them either individually or in groups of two or three to get in a car and to drive the route and just observe. And the route would take them from the wealth of Alamo Heights and Almost Park down into the east side of San Antonio and the south side of San Antonio and the west side of San Antonio in and out of streets that were so tiny and that had houses so tiny you could barely, you could barely squeeze them next to each other to the mansions in Almost Park. And then we would get together and talk about what was seen. And people would say things like, I had no idea people in San Antonio lived in those conditions. I had no idea that there was that level of disparity in wealth in this city. Because we don't see, we don't take the time to look <coughs> at the full picture. We just look at what is in front of us. And if we don't see it, we can't do anything about it. There's no motivation to develop the, the equity that is required for everyone to be able to enjoy the game, as it were. If we're sitting in the left-hand position in equality and the game is great for us, and we don't ever turn to look at our 
little brother who's on the same size box but can't even see because the fence is the only thing in front of his face, we can't do anything about it if we don't turn to look. But if we do, then we have the opportunity to act for change. And I want to celebrate some of the ways in which this congregation, together with H&S, does things to create some equity. <coughs> Troop 52 works with boys who could never be in a Boy Scout troop that required them to pay for all of their uniforms and fees because they simply come from households where that disposable income is not available. And so they work hard together and they lean on some of us who have a little extra to be able to provide for them what they need so they can fully participate in the Boy Scout game, right? Without feeling less than. In Kids Place, there are kids who come in who are referred by CPS because of the risk of child abuse. And there are often families that have very limited parenting experience or access to education about how to be a good parent. There are often emotional and other developmental issues that are part of those kids' realities and those parents' realities. And so you put all those kids in the same kindergarten room together and you expect them to all be able to play kindergarten at the same level, and they can't. And so H&S works hard partnering with other agencies in the community to bring language and learning disability support, uh, parent education to these kids, and opportunities for both the parents and the kids to learn how to do new behaviors to deal with emotional instability in their lives. And by doing that, we stack a couple boxes under these kids so that they can play the kindergarten game with everybody else. The gift of Christmas that we just celebrated. A harvesting of a little bit of our extra so that a family that has very little hope of joy this Christmas will have a Christmas that is joyful. If we want to be a part of God's cosmic inversion, if we want to participate with Mary in celebrating a God who brings down the proud and lifts up the humble, a God who fills the empty tummies with what they need and sends those who've already got too much away, not because they're bad, but because we all need enough then it's our job to cultivate eyes that can see the inequities around us. Because if we never see them, we will never do anything about them. Mary clearly shared her vision, her perspective with her son. Because three chapters later in Luke's Gospel, when Jesus launches his ministry publicly in Nazareth at the synagogue, he speaks these words. God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, release for the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of God's favor. It was Mary's hope and song. It was Jesus' mission in life. And now, it's ours. Because we are the body of Christ. Let us pray. Amoroso Dios, Tu amor es suficiente para todos, pero tu amor busca en una forma particular a los más pequeños y olvidados, a los separados 
y desechados, porque quieres reunir a toda la humanidad en una sola familia, donde habrá suficiente para todos y donde tú desde el último lugar puedes extender tus brazos y abrazar a la humanidad entera. Concédenos, oh Dios, la gracia de poder hacer la misma cosa. En tu nombre te lo pedimos. Amén. Amén.